Known as Europe's last wilderness, the Hebrides archipelago isn't just a land of beauty. It's one of the most hostile places on the planet. While secret coves and deserted beaches provide sanctuary to a host of wild creatures, for thousands of years, people have battled with the elements. Even the Vikings struggled to survive. Fueled by rich organic seas, the region's wildlife thrives. But many human settlers disappear, adding myth and legend to these wild islands of mystery. Lying just off the coast of West Scotland, the Hebrides archipelago is made up of more than 500 islands and islets. Stretching 200 kilometers from north to south, it's divided into an inner and outer group. Many low-lying islands were born from the gradual uplift of rock that's over three billion years old. Others were formed more recently and violently through volcanic explosions. Isolation from the mainland has made the Hebrides the perfect breeding ground for millions of creatures. The islands are home to some of the largest gatherings and greatest spectacles on the planet. Eight thousand years ago, people also set up home here. But many succumb to the island's often hostile weather and intimidating seas. Evidence of previous communities lies littered throughout the archipelago. Islanders cling onto island life by a thread. Ever since their exposure following the end of the Ice Age, the Hebrides has always been a land of mystery. Early sailors recounted calls of mermaids from coastal caves. Unable to resist their lure, many were beckoned to a watery grave. These half-human, half-fish creatures remain a myth. But eerie calls from the caves are reported even today. Many grey seals choose the safety of hidden caves when giving birth to their pups. They are one of the most vocal of all seal species. Half of the world's population of grey seals live along the British coast. But not all mothers choose the privacy of a personal birthing room. The Monarch Isles sit on the edge of the Outer Hebrides chain.
The island's isolated beaches are the perfect location for one of the largest gatherings of grey seals on the planet. Each winter, over 35,000 arrive on Monarch's shores. Mothers give birth to just a single pump at a time. However, around 9,000 are born here each year. Pups are suckled for just 18 days. The mother's milk is so rich, it contains around 60% fat. The youngsters are born weighing around 14 kilograms and put on approximately two kilos a day. In around three weeks, their weight more than triples. Once this short suckling period is over, the pup is abandoned. The mothers need to mate again. Bull seals play no part in raising their young. But these half-ton giants put every effort into claiming the breeding rights. It takes around 10 years to be big and strong enough to win a territorial battle. A snarl is often enough to see off lesser rivals. Sometimes, the odds are more evenly balanced. And these two males appear to have met their match. Fights are often bloody and can be to the death. backs down. Siring his next generation will have to wait. In around two weeks time, hunger will drive the abandoned pups to fend for themselves in the island's fish-rich sea. While the low-lying Monarch Isles provide sanctuary to some of the region's largest marine predators, the mountains of another island play home to Britain's biggest land mammal. The Isle of Rum lies at the heart of the Inner Hebrides. Conical peaks and rolling hills are at the core of a deeply eroded volcano, last active around 25 million years ago. This island's dramatic creation may be long in the past, but today it's the setting for one of nature's most energetic wildlife spectacles. Red deer are the third largest deer in the world. Around 900 roam this remote island. Their population has remained relatively stable due to being isolated from mainland predators. Despite this, internal casualties have become a matter of course. These stags are stocking up for the annual rot. Old antlers from last year's battles provide an important source of calcium. Mature males weigh just under 200 kilos and stand a metre and a half tall at the shoulder. 
There will be no mercy for lightweights. This stag has separated from the rest of his male companions. He's rounded up a small group of females who've responded to his mating calls. But he isn't the only one with eyes on this harem. The rival challenges his opponent by walking parallel to him and roaring. One's antlers and size have been assessed. The pair launch into battle. These intense bouts of sparring are often bloody as well as fatal. But with breeding rights at stake, it's a risk most males are willing to take. Individual clashes are usually over in a matter of minutes. But once the rut begins, the battle continues on and off for around four weeks. Those deer that pay the ultimate price in their quest to acquire mates play an important role in the life of another creature. During winter, one of Britain's most famous and rarest birds relies on rock victims in order to survive. Golden eagles have a wingspan of up to two and a half meters. They're one of the most powerful flying predators in the world. They usually hunt rabbits and hares, but carrion is a vital part of their winter diet. Their eyesight is eight times sharper than a human's. They can spot a deer carcass from more than a kilometer away. In Celtic mythology, the golden eagle is revered. It symbolized the soul, signifying the power of life over death. However, another creature on the island had the opposite effect. Its calls made superstitious Vikings believe the hills were inhabited by trolls. Each spring, 120,000 pairs of Manx shearwaters arrive on Rom's coast. The island is the final destination on their 16,000 kilometer journey from South America. The hill's soft volcanic soil provides the perfect nesting ground. And with no ground-dwelling predators, it's the perfect place to breed. just under 40 centimeters long, Manx shearwaters are relatively small seabirds. They're no match for avian hunters like black-backed gulls that are more than twice their size. Shearwaters have a unique survival strategy. Each partner takes turns at fishing and incubating their eggs. To avoid being attacked, they return to their burrows under the cover of night. These eerie calls and coos are essential in order for each pair to be reunited. 
It's easy to understand how this added to the Vikings' demonic beliefs. Especially as when the sun rises, there's not a single sound. Many myths and legends are linked to the island's dry land. But some of the most remarkable emerged from the surrounding sea. Forty miles further north, on the Isle of Skye, 81-year-old Ian MacDonald is on his annual mission. He spent his whole life recounting tales of enormous beasts swimming these seas. Today, he's about to witness the event once more. Each October, Ian moves his cattle to Stenshall Island, where they graze during winter. It's now spring, and he's returning them to the main island. With no land bridge connecting Skye to Stenshall, the cows have only one option. Centuries ago, swimming cattle between islands was commonplace. Today, Ian is the last farmer in the Hebrides to continue this age-old tradition. At low tide, the seas separating the islands appear welcoming. But when the waters turn, it's a different story entirely. Between the Isles of Scarba and Jura, strong Atlantic currents and an underwater peak combine to create some of the most treacherous waters on the planet. The tide speeds up as it enters the narrow channel between the islands. On hitting the underwater pinnacle, Standing waves over six meters tall rise to the surface. This is Corrie Vrecken, the third largest whirlpool in the world. Its roar can be heard more than 16 kilometers away. Legend has it, a Viking prince spent three days and nights on a boat anchored beside the whirlpool to prove he was worthy of marrying a Hebridean princess. On the advice of scholars, the prince had three special ropes made. One was woven from wool, one from hemp, and the last used hair from virtuous maidens. On the third night, his boat was sucked into the vortex. The anchor rope, made from the maiden's hair, snapped. It turned out that one of the donors hadn't been virtuous after all.
the prince's body was later washed up and buried in the nearby king's cave. Corryvreckan Whirlpool plays an important role in the Hebrides' underwater ecosystem. The rising waters and sucking walls create an upwelling of nutrients and act as barriers that concentrate the plankton. Herring and sand eels thrive on these miniature meals. These in turn provide food for larger predators. Shearwaters are first on the scene, snatching at fish just below the surface. But they are soon eclipsed by the master high diver of all. Northern gannets are graceful flyers. They have a wingspan of around two meters. Unlike most birds, they have forward-facing eyes, which provide binocular vision. This allows them to estimate how far the fish are from the surface of the water. Once locked onto their targets, they fold back their wings and plummet. Gannets can hit the water at over 100 kilometers per hour to capture prey. At the moment of impact, they stretch their bodies into a streamlined, torpedo-like shape. A maze of air cells between their skin and muscles is inflated to help cushion the blow. It isn't only birds that are attracted to these feeding frenzies. The Hebrides' fish-rich waters also support some of the largest creatures on the planet. Minke whales weigh up to 15 tons and reach over 10 meters in length. They lunge at their prey from beneath the surface. Large volumes of fish and water are engulfed before being sieved and swallowed whole. The whales generally live solitary lives, but can gather in groups of 10 or more when feeding. Seas surrounding the Hebrides are some of the richest in the world. Around these isolated islands, the warm Gulf Stream waters reach their northern extremity. At the same time, cooler currents from the north bring many species to their southern limits. This temperature transition is reflected in the great diversity of marine creatures found here. Twenty-four species of whale, dolphin and porpoise patrol these waters, including Britain's largest fish. Basking sharks can reach up to seven meters in length and have a dorsal fin up to a meter and a half high. They're drawn to the Hebrides' plankton-rich waters where they remain close to the surface to feed.
they filter around a million and a half litres of water every hour, trapping the tiny creatures in their extensive gill rakers. The island's inlets, known as lochs, also provide a food source for many animals, including Europe's largest bird of prey. White-tailed eagles have a wingspan approaching two and a half meters. Their eyes are larger than humans, and like the golden eagle, their vision is far sharper than our own. Each of their eyes has two centers of focus. They can see forwards and sideways at the same time. From an altitude of 300 meters, they can pinpoint a shoal of fish within an area of almost eight square kilometers. This bird has locked onto its target and prepares to swoop in. Also known as a sea eagle, the white-tailed eagle's diet includes a great deal of fish. During the breeding season, it's the most important food. Young chicks have big appetites. White-tailed eagles usually lay one or two eggs, so twins are common. The young remain in the nest for around 10 weeks before they fledge. Parents use the same nest for several years. The collection of sticks can end up weighing as much as a small car, almost a thousand kilograms. On another island in the Outer Hebrides, lie a number of clues to the existence of early man. The Isle of Lewis and Harris contains some of the earliest evidence of humans inhabiting the Hebrides. Six thousand year old peat bogs point to woodlands being raised to the ground by Neolithic herders to allow their deer to graze. Today the island remains virtually treeless. While certain clues to early settlers lie deep beneath the surface, in one location is a monument that towers above the rest. The standing stones at Kalanish were erected around 4,000 years ago. They were old, long before Rome was heard of. Thirteen stones, averaging four meters tall, form a circle 13 meters across. They surround an even taller central monolith. Legend has it that giants who once lived on the island were turned to stone as a punishment for refusing to convert to Christianity. The stones are also said to receive a ghostly visitation on the dawn of the midsummer solstice. 
a shining figure is said to walk through the circle, heralded by the call of a cuckoo. Other theories point to Kalanish being an ancient burial site, or having an astronomical purpose. The structure's true purpose, however, remains a mystery. The Kalanish stones are made of Luetian gneiss, one of the hardest types of rock in the world. It plays an important role at the coast of the island, helping create a unique environment. The Macaire is one of Europe's rarest habitats. It's unique to northwest Scotland and the west of Ireland. These windswept coastal plains consist of calcium-rich shell sand that is highly fertile and free-draining. Luetian gneiss, which makes up the region's bedrock, doesn't erode easily. This means that rivers flowing to the coast carry very little sediment, which keeps the Macaire sands free of bulky organic matter. These are the most fertile soils on the islands and have always influenced the location of human settlements. Around 20,000 people live on the island today. Just offshore, some of Europe's most elusive creatures have also set up home here. Despite their name, common seals are quite rare. Their grey cousins outnumber them by a ratio of six to one. At just under two metres in length, they're smaller than the grey and prefer to bask on rocks and secluded inlets. Common seals travel up to 50 kilometres to feed and often remain at sea for several days. They can dive underwater for up to 10 minutes and reach depths of more than 50 meters. These coastal inlets are also home to one of the world's most secretive freshwater mammals. The Hebrides is home to the densest population of otters in northwest Europe. At high tide, they feed in the island's food-rich coastal waters. The otters rely on the sea for the majority of their food, but they still need fresh water to wash away the salt and keep their coats waterproof. They spend most of their time on dry land. Local folklore tells tales of otter kings who were accompanied by seven black otters. When captured, these beasts would grant any wish in exchange for their freedom. The Shant Isles lie six kilometers off the coast of Lewis and Harris. The surrounding waters are famed for another legend.
the blue men of the Minch are said to have inhabited underwater caves. Sailors were fearful of passing through this stretch of water, as they believed that merman-type creatures would lure them to their deaths. For many years, the Shans sustained a small population of around 30 people. However, the last residents abandoned the islands over a century ago. These isolated isles are built entirely from hexagonally jointed basalt columns. They're part of the same ancient lava flow that formed the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland 60 million years ago. The magma cooled rapidly, forcing it to crystallize and form these giant geometric shapes. Standing 120 meters tall, these spectacular columns dwarf their Irish counterparts. The island's grassy cliffs are the breeding home to an estimated 80,000 pairs of Atlantic puffins. These enigmatic birds live a solitary life out at sea for most of the year. During summer, they congregate in immense numbers. Puffins choose the same mating partner for life, and reunited couples reuse last season's nesting burrow. Sand eels are the staple diet for a newly hatched chick. Both parents take turns fishing. Feeding areas can range up to 100 kilometers offshore, so several fish are caught on each trip. Their tongues hold anything they catch against spines in their palate. This leaves the bill free to capture more fish. Puffins are small birds, standing just 18 centimeters tall and weighing around 500 grams. They are the perfect meal for an aerial predator more than three times their size. Great black-backed gulls are opportunistic hunters that steal and scavenge most of their food. They're the largest of all gulls and will hunt and kill any creatures smaller than themselves. This one has locked onto its target. The puffin stands little chance against the gull's aggression, strength and endurance. Many partners never return from their fishing trips. The Shant Isles may be isolated, but their location between the inner and outer islands doesn't quite make them remote.
to the far west of the outer islands sits the most hostile and isolated archipelago of all. A legendary land where people eat birds. St Kilda is by far the remotest of all the Hebridean islands. Lying 160 kilometers from the mainland, the archipelago was formed around 60 million years ago through volcanic activity. It contains the highest sea cliffs in Britain, which face some of the harshest storms the Atlantic Ocean has to offer. The climate is generally cool, with mist and showers dampening the islands at all times of the year. It's thought that people arrived at St Kilda as early as the Bronze Age. These visitors brought with them one of the world's most primitive forms of sheep. Four thousand years later, the Soe sheep are still here. They're smaller than domestic sheep, but hardier and far more agile. Unlike their relatives, Soe sheep shed their coats naturally, so don't require shearing. Their extraordinary long reign on the islands is in part down to the fact that they don't herd together like ordinary sheep. When startled, they separate and scatter in all directions, making their capture difficult for predators. Around 2,000 Soe sheep roam St Kilda today. Iron Age houses, a testament to people setting a permanent home around 2,000 years ago. This line of continuous habitation came to an abrupt end just over 80 years ago. For centuries, people survived by eating the island's vast supply of seabirds. St Kilda's cliffs are home to some of the largest populations of seabirds in the world. Because fishing the Atlantic's stormy seas was too dangerous, people turned to an alternative supply of food. Gannets, fulmars and puffins made up the majority of their diet. Each resident ate on average 115 fulmars every year. Puffins became an everyday snack, just like a packet of crisps. But this source of food was seasonal. The birds only used St Kilda to nest. At the end of summer, the islanders' cliffs became bare. In 1930, following food shortages and disease, the last 36 residents of St Kilda were evacuated to the mainland. Over 60,000 pairs of gannets still return to St Kilda each spring. It's the largest colony in the world. Although people no longer pose a threat to the seabirds, some of their own have taken to piracy. Great skewers arrived on St Kilda around 50 years ago. Gannets are much larger than these aerial thieves, but skewers work in teams. They harass their targets, forcing them to regurgitate their prey. Grabbing their victims' wings mid-flight causes them to stall and crash into the sea.
Not all gannets survive such attacks, and the skewers end up with an even larger bounty. One bird, however, isn't prepared to just lie down and die. Fulmars are medium-sized seabirds with a wingspan of just over a meter. On paper, they're no match for the island's aggressive predators. But this unassuming bird has a secret weapon. It spots an approaching Arctic skewer, another of the island's thieves. As the intruder gets within striking range, the Fulmar unleashes a unique defense. This projectile vomit consists of highly acidic fish oil. The Fulmars have a spitting range of up to one and a half meters. The foul-smelling noxious oil damages intruder's feathers, which affects waterproofing in flight. Most predators have learned to give this particular species a very wide berth. St Kilda has the largest breeding population of fulmars in the UK, over 65,000 pairs. They played an important role in the lives of the people who lived here. Along with being part of their staple diet, the bird's oil was used for burning in lamps. It even had a medicinal purpose, being rubbed into tired muscles. Today, fulmars and all other seabirds in Britain are protected by law. However, there is an exception and on one island, the bird-eating legend lives on. In the small town of Ness, in the Outer Hebrides, a group of men are setting sail for Sula Skier, a remote island 60 kilometers north of their home. Each August, they take part in the annual Guga hunt. Guga is the Scottish Gaelic name for gannet chick. And at this time of year, Suda Skier has around 5,000 on the verge of fledging. Over a 10-day period, 2,000 almost fully grown chicks are grabbed from their nests. Killed, they're plucked, singed, and salted. Guga meat is seen as a delicacy. People from Ness have been hunting gannets on this small island for over 500 years. It's an age-old tradition that today continues.
the Hebrides is a land of wonder. Isolation and food-rich seas provide safety for many wild creatures. But over time, people have struggled to survive. Myth and legend litter the island's shores. But many wild spectacles and age-old traditions live on.